AI can possibly do for the arts, with the arts. And so we've had, we've, we have in our midst a whole bunch of the artists who've worked together over the last two years. We have some of our mentors who've mentored the process. Um, and within these mostly Zoom rooms were discussions, debates, um, and thoughts on how the artist community could, could or should embrace new technologies of this current moment. Um, I think if you could, if you walked around the space, not all of the art is celebratory of AI coming into its space. Some of them are also critical. Some of the art pieces have investigated the idea of the labor of making data sets. AI is a hungry data monster, if you may. And whose data are you using? How do you use it? So we do have art pieces that have investigated just even the making of their own data. If you go up into the gallery on the second floor, you'll see their piece. Where do I come from? Where do I go? Bruce, who's on stage here, is through his work trying to look at the edge of misclassification, misrecognition, and those raw edges of AI, if you may. Uh, so this panel is really set within that context of being critical of what we're using this for and how we're using this and why we're using this. So I welcome Padmini. Padmini is, um, let me pull up my notes. <laughs> Just so I don't get it wrong, Padmini. I can tell stories about you, but. <laughs> so uh, Padmini, Padmini's practice focuses on challenging the acts of infrastructural and algorithmic violence and creating alternative digital spaces and imaginations that are characterized by feminist values, specifically of ethics and care. She's also the founder of Design Beku, a collective that emerged from a desire to explore how technology and design can be decolonial, local, and ethical. Thanks, Padmini. Thanks, Kamya, for that introduction, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on introductions because uh, they're all on the website and I'd like to use the time um, more valuably uh, speaking to our wonderful speakers and um, I will, however, mention why I asked them to be on this panel. Um, also to just set the context, thanks Kamya for um, kind of putting that into perspective. Uh, I think, like Benson, I'd like to thank Future Fantastic for uh, having the courage to <laughs> um, allow this conversation to happen because I think in our first conversation, I very explicitly said that I'm incredibly skeptical of AI being used as a vehicle for talking about climate change because itself, AI itself is so incredibly extractive. Um, uh, but, you know, how better to kind of address these topics rather than, you know, through conversation and debate. So here we are. Um, so I have uh, two wonderful sp speakers with me here, uh, Jake Elwes and Bruce Gilchrist. And coming in from the UK, uh, Danny Admis and Vishal, who is in Bangalore, but in another neighborhood. <laughs> uh, so right. So I'm just going to start off uh, with Danny. And it'll become clear why I asked Danny to be part of this. So Danny um, is part of this incredible project called Sunlight Doesn't Need a Pipeline. And it's about decarbonization in the arts. And uh, she's been doing some fabulous work around this, putting together manifestos, essays, articles, projects, et cetera, ably aided by many other artists and thinkers all over the world. And so I'm gonna start with Danny because I feel like her work kind of helpfully frames the questions that we'll be discussing today. So uh, Danny, uh, in your essay, Prepping for Utopia, a convoluted imaginary for a just transition, you write, and I quote, any radical imaginary must consider the paradoxical aspects of the green era, its collective thought and action, and contribute to a more critical comprehension of current ecological and social crises and the range of responses to them. So could you just tell us a little bit more about your work and how it addresses this critical comprehension? Thanks. Thanks so much, Padmini. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here on this lovely panel. Um, and also thanks to all the Future Fantastic team. I know how difficult it is to put these kinds of events on. Um, so I think I just want to start really by um, 
maybe echoing what Padmini uh, just opened the panel with by saying that actually, even though my work engages with technologies, often it's very lo-fi. Um, and my work as a curator and a researcher is really often not about the objects other people make, but the relationships we can build together. And I've really, for ever since I can remember, been fascinated with how stories of science, stories of technology, uh, often these stories or narratives we, see, we receive from the government or from uh, spaces of research and industry, uh, and that often shape society, right, are, are in um, tension with marginalized communities or how we see ourselves in our lived experiences. And I think these stories, um, particularly around sustainability, around science and technology, uh, often purify themselves, right? Uh, we don't, they're not really seen within the messiness of life, uh, nor are they thought through in terms of intersectional, um, real, uh, real world impacts. And so I'm really interested in this idea of plurality and the complexity that we need in stories that creatives and artists tell uh, about the society we live in. Um, so I'll just maybe say that, as Padmini mentioned, for the last few years, I've been working on an arts, climate justice and collaborative learning project called Sunlight Doesn't Need a Pipeline. Um, and essentially, this project over about three years has brought together 150 different types of art workers. So artists, activists, researchers, healers, engineers, growers, um, as well as kind of different local community groups throughout the UK and art workers internationally to think about what transitioning to a low carbon planet in a socially just way might look like in the creative art sector and beyond. Um, I love to, I love a diagram and I just always like to put this diagram in because I want to make the point that um, actually the Sunlight Project and all of my work is not just about planet, it's also about people. Uh, and at its core, we're thinking about ideas to do with workers' rights and redistribution as much as we're thinking about biodiversity and low carbon impact. And I feel that everything when we talk about the climate should be entangled in this way, that we're moving away from extractive practices. Um, so yes, since 2020, a coalition of like 150 art workers and local community groups have come together to do different types of community-based research, uh, workshops, a festival, thinking about um, how can we write or collaboratively author a holistic decarbonization plan for the sector. Um, really importantly, and because I logged on really way too early, uh, Alison Bissett, uh, when she was opening the festival, was saying that she wasn't a technical expert on the climate. I'd like to say that none of us were technical experts or are technical experts on the climate. But I have this real belief that these are our stories, our stories of sustainability, our stories of climate, and so we should be part of them. Um, and maybe just to show you a really quick video, just kind of of the website. Um, so yeah, the outcome of Sunlight is that we have this beautiful um, website designed by Studio Height. Uh, it's a low carbon website, but it's also uh, accessible for people with different visual impairment needs. And on it, there are a number of case studies, guidelines, essays and provocations that were all collaboratively authored that look at issues from wealth to digital practice in the green era, to the life cycles of plants and how they relate to the art sector and beyond. And maybe just to link back to your question about critical comprehension, um, I feel that in the climate emergency, many of us bear differential burdens, right? Like the, the ways that we are being affected at the moment are not even. Um, but there is no clear vision. There is no quick fix to this solution. Uh, it's intractable and interlocking, right? And so I feel it's really important that as creatives, as curators, as artists, we think not only about the current situation, um, but include ways to articulate the histories that hold us down, as well as the dynamics we inherit and benefit from in the present. And thinking holistically uh, will help us to think deeply about what needs repairing, right? Uh, where our energies must go or not go in the case of AI and art, and, um, and what kinds of healing must be done.
So thanks. I hope I didn't take up too much time. No, thanks so much, Danny. That's a great note to start on. Uh, so I just move on to uh, Jake and Vishal. Um, so Jake, if you want to respond first. Uh, both of you use AI to prize open the way that we think and talk about technology and how those are shaped and contextualized by different uh, structurally marginalized spaces. So in your case, Jake, uh, through a queer lens and Vishal thinking through caste, data, and race. So while your work might not directly speak to environmental themes, uh, we do know that the marginalized are directly you know, much more affected by climate change and the climate emergency than others. So would you like to speak a little bit about how your choices have been shaped artistically um, across that backdrop as course, well as... Yeah. yeah. I'll show a few slides in a minute oh. to show you some of the projects that I've been working on. Um, <clears throat> but my latest project all, is all about queerness and about otherness and really thinking about who's not represented in data sets. So data sets trained on normativity, what happens if we inject otherness, if we kind of force it to see us in a different way and really try and sort of tackle more social injustice. Um, but there's also a work of mine um, next door which is about much more the environment, an environment that I grew up in, um, the Essex marshes and kind of bringing nature back through the means of AI, um, which I'll talk a bit about in my slides. But I don't know if that quite answered your question in this instance, but I'll speak more about it when I go through the work. Cool. Do you want to just uh, walk us through the slides? Yeah, OK. Should we do the slides now? Yeah. Does that make sense? Should I stand up there? If that or makes sense. Or you that... can see, see them there yeah. as well. Yeah. Sure. Go I feel it. like standing. Is that OK? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> but just tell me when to stop. Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right, I'll talk a bit now. Um, so I wanted to start off by thinking a little bit about who's actually creating these systems that we're all using. Um, and in a way, turning the AI lens back on the people that are building these systems. So rather than necessarily thinking about sort of AI consciousness and kind of existential risk, much more thinking about the here and now. Who's building these systems and who are they building them for? And who are they building them in mind? Um, so if we could go to the next slide. I don't know if we could make this full screen. And hopefully, we've got sound. Can we switch to slideshow? Yeah, thanks. So if we could just maybe press play. If we press next again, will it start? Five, six, five, 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 four, five, and four. One, six, six, seven, 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 eight, eight, and nine, nine, five thousand. One billion, one thirty million, one hundred million, two billion, one, two hundred. Two hundred fifty, seventy, one, ten thousand, one hundred fifty, ten thousand, eighteen thousand, one, ten, sixteen, sixteen, two, three hundred fifty, twenty hundred, two, 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 twenty three hundred fifty, fifty, ten fifty, nine thousand, nine thousand, one thousand, one six billion, hundred million, hundred million, one hundred million, six hundred, one hundred million, one, one, ten billion, five, thirty million, one, three, two, twenty. 27 million to 100. One. One. Five, thirty thousand, zero. One. Ten. Ten thousand. Ten thousand. Three. Three. Three or four hundred billion. One tr trillion. Three hundred eighty two. Three hundred fifty thousand. Three hundred fifty five, four. Four twenty. Ten. Or one three trillion. Seventeen. Four hundred trillions. Five hundred millions. One tens of thousands. Millions. Five hundred billion. Fifteen. Four six trillion. Two million. Five thousand. Fifty billion. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> so you can see a longer extract of this video on my website, but. It's effectively, it's the um, Forbes 50 most powerful tech CEOs at the time when I made this work in 2016. And as you may have noticed, there's a particular kind of person that I think pretty much all American white men. Um, I think Jack Ma was possibly the only exception. So if we go to the next slides, I, I'll quickly speak about a concept. So as an artist, there's this concept which I thought was so beautiful. Um, when I first discovered AI and started working with AI about seven or eight years ago, that really kind of opened my mind and in a way was a different way of thinking about these systems rather than thinking about sort of the much more anthropomorphized narratives and metaphors of trying to understand AI through consciousness and the way human brains work. It's actually understanding machine learning in spatial terms. So moving through this multi-dimensional latent space, which is effectively the result of every time you train a machine learning algorithm, it's just trying to sort data right, in these spaces. So let's say that we've trained a neural network, a classifier network, on, on faces, on 100,000 faces, let's say, for facial recognition. It will reduce all of these images, all of this pixel data, into an output of effectively 512 numbers. right? That's sort of a common way of doing it. And this will relate to a coordinate, a space, right? 
So then if we give it a new image, like a classifier of a face of a human, it will say, okay, this new image, from what I've learned, will probably exist somewhere around here with these 512 numbers. And that corresponds to what I've learned might be a white man in their 30s, right? <laughs> um, but we can do this with all sorts of different data. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can also plot the whole of the English language in this multidimensional space, and you can reduce it. If, if we go to the next slide, does it move? Here we go. So here is a representation of, I think, 100,000 words of the English language plotted in this space, right? And we've kind of reduced it to three dimensions, but actually it would be many dimensions. It's understood the context of these words. So effectively, this latent space is, is a really fascinating concept because it's the bias. It's everything that it has learned from data. But what stands outside of this space is what it hasn't seen, right? So this is the data that we haven't fed it, that the network hasn't learned from. I also think this actually is a queer space because everything here is reduced to mathematics. So you can do these amazing things where you move in the in-between spaces, data points that never actually existed. But you can say, what would happen if I was like in between these words? And, and this language model is fascinating because you can actually, um, you can, you can do like mental arithmetic on words. I don't know if you've seen any of this. It's really cool. So you can say like, what's the bias of taking the word man to a particular word and then the word woman to a similar area, kind of in this mathematical space? And it will start to point out bias in language, um, just kind of through moving mathematically in this space. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So this is kind of where a lot of my art comes from is like, early generative models, is taking this latent space and saying, generate me images from points in this space. So the work that you see outside is actually a piece where I wanted to like go and plant the most technologically advanced thing at the time, which was kind of a generative adversarial network trained on birds, but more specifically on marsh birds from a childhood landscape that I've been visiting since I was a child and effectively see how the AI would understand these birds. And my idea was to then take that into nature and have a conversation between this cold mathematical counting machine with this ancient organic landscape, which was the Essex marshes. And it's also one of the richest places in biodiversity in the UK, but sadly, a lot of these species are now endangered. Um, also, fascinatingly, like the AI sees all of these birds in profile, which is fascinating. Because for me, it's similar to how humans try to comprehend the natural worlds with cave painting, which is sort of much easier to understand and comprehend birds or species through images of them in profile. And this is the sort of AI in its infancy trying to comprehend what marsh birds look like. Um, so, if we go to the next picture, um, the the concept of this piece then was to take these birds out and plonk them. So we got the next slide. I don't know if there's a bit of a delay, maybe. Um, plonk them actually out in the mud. <laughs> you know, get really physical with this and project it and have a visual dialogue with the real birds talking to these AI-generated birds. All the sounds are also generated in this piece um, from 10 hours of field recordings. Um, so if we just go on, and then kind of from there, yeah, working with, with nature has always actually been something I've, I've loved to do. So thinking about when these technologies fail on nature. Um, <coughs> so actually scanning, scanning trees and using machine learning algorithms from photographs to do photogrammetry um, and, and generating these kind of point clouds, but where I will take walks in lockdown and whatever the camera didn't see is where this algorithm fails and breaks down. Um, and I don't know how much, shall I, shall I stop seeing one or two more slides? Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll just very, very briefly now talk about my querying project. So if we go to the next slide. Um, these are all images of human faces. You might be familiar with these. These are kind of early predecessor to some of the deep fakes that we have now. Um, and this was back in 2019, Salgan paper. And these are all imagined faces. But as you might notice, there's a particular type of person that gets overly represented in these data sets. I think this data set was actually kind of made to try and tackle some of the racial bias. Um, earlier ones were even worse. They were trained on American celebrities, so they effectively only saw a very specific kind of person. Um, but my idea was to take this data set, so these are all fake faces at different points in a latent space, trained on 70,000 faces, which is a commonly used data set for facial recognition, and to effectively queer it 
to inject it with otherness and say, what, what will that do to this data set? So I took a thousand images of drag, drag kings, drag queens, drag things, um, and basically using drag as a form of gender nonconformity, of like how can we tackle gender bias in these systems? Let's put otherness, let's put queerness, something that it won't recognize. So if we go to the next slide, these points in a latent space go from here to here. And this is after they've seen the drag performance. <laughs> um, and if we go to the next slide again, <coughs> this is quite fun. So you can then move on a journey through this multidimensional space, and it will generate through all of the images that it has learned. And like for me, this is a beautiful concept. Like this is a non-linear video. It can go in any direction at any time. And suddenly we're starting to see the queerness of machine learning, of latent space. And in a way, like for me, it's about trying to see a queer utopia. Actually, how can we, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> see, see alternative ways of using these tools and these technologies. Um, so I think I'll stop there. You can go online and have a look at the other projects. I've, I've got another one, but I don't think we've got time for another video. But there are, I started to work with performers and deep fakes and think about how can we actually empower our community with these systems rather than how they're usually used to sort of oppress and control. Um, so anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jake. Um, that video that you showed earlier on of all the white rich people. Yeah. Um, so there's, <laughs> yes. this, there's this amazing phrase that was coined by Catherine, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein called Big Dick Data. And that's exactly yeah. what it felt like. <laughs> it was amazing. All right, uh, over to you, Vishal. Thank you. Hey, um, I might actually end up sharing my screen. Great. Let's see if I, I can. I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, oh. Absolutely no idea. Michelle, do you need any help at our end, or are you okay? The joys of working with technology. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, are you able to see my screen? No, we can't see you nor the screen, actually. So bizarre. Um, for some reason, I had chess screen, and it's kind of goes to. Uh, Maybe, yeah. Is the previous share screen on, or do you want to? Can you close that last slide? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I don't actually see. I can only share content, but I can just speak to it. It's just much easier. Sure. Okay. Um, sure. I was just going to show a couple of works from before. Um, big fan of Jake's work. I've followed um, their work since since the Slade degree show, actually. Um, <laughs> It was this really beautiful generative poetry installation um, that I remember coming across when I saw the work. Um, I guess, like in part, the, the the kind of like research that I was going to speak about was um, just kind of going back into how my own sort of experience with AI has been, um, starting with kind of just looking at what are the kind of stories that are being told about the city um, in narratives around technology and AI and what are the kind of uh, omissions being made, who are, who's being omitted, what stories are being omitted, what is being included in this sort of uh, very capitalist success story that is kind of spread about Bangalore. And I started looking at this kind of computer marketplace in Bangalore called SP Road, um, which is kind of where I kind of spent a lot of time uh, like in school and, and college, learning how to build things and computers and stuff like that. Um, but it's this very um, strange way in which um, a place like that, which is very crucial to the growth of, of technology in the city, is completely erased and it's not in there, um, in, in any of the storytelling that is there around, around tech at all. Um, so I started looking at 
how would I think about speaking of my own experiences, but also speaking about the ways in which um, education around technology and in, in effect AI is accessed. A lot of this is DIY tinkering. A lot of it is people have access to uh, tools and materials because they're literally dealing in them, they're selling them. Um, and they are living um, a very, very sort of futuristic technological existence, but it's kind of um, kind of hidden away from, from where the gaze is. And it's also where the first conversations around like the blockchain and AI and tech is where I first encountered in practice because um, theory isn't as important if you're trying to mint or like mine blockchain and mint money from it. Um, you're really focused in understanding, focused on understanding how you put the technology to use um, and thus the way in which the education required to make that happen, the way that access is is kind of claim is very, very different than the kind of conversations where we're having even now here on, on the stage and um, elsewhere just in the theory and, and speaking about scholarship around AI and tech. Um, and that was what I was interested in. I was interested in what are the sort of narratives that we're building, what are the narratives that I relate to, where, where is it like, where, where does my position lie? Um, but also most importantly, what, is, what are these metal fictions that we're constructing around um, uh, around like how, what these pieces of technology actually do. And one of the things that, that came to me was um, how, how little language was used, particularly in the city and, and how little of, of the language of the si languages of the city were actually featuring in, in works being made here, um, whether it's Kannada or Marathi or, or Tamil or Telugu or Malayalam. Um, how little there were stories around gender and caste and, and the labor of, um, not just the labor of, of, of code or the labor of building technology, but the labor of the ancillary kind of like infrastructure and, and what that, um, what the actual stories of that are. So in, in many ways, it was like stories of the city to, being told from many, many sort of different viewpoints and I started kind of like working a little bit with, um, with with generative adversarial networks just to kind of understand what the image of this marketplace would start to look. Um, and in the end, I kind of entirely discarded it and went a completely different way using LIDAR and, and, and simulations and things like that. But it eventually led me to start to look at the kind of subtext and behind the scenes mechanisms in which these algorithms and tools are being built. Um, like who's building them, like Jake was saying, who is it for, but also particularly this kind of weird position of being an artist based in Bangalore, from Bangalore, looking around the story of technology evolving over the last like 20 something years and not finding a place for yourself. In, in that story in some way, um, even as an artist working with technology. And, and it kind of came to the point of saying, okay, let's step, let's start looking at um, just language as, as the entry point and look at how little support there is for um, vernacular languages in India. Eventually, it kind of became about um, doing a comparative study of uh, two poets, the black beat poet, Bob Kaufman, um, his words, as well as the words of Dr. Sittlinger, uh, translated into English, put into early versions of GPT-3, and then kind of just looking at the gaps in which they're unable to decode the context because they can't. At, the, at, at best, they can generate, I guess, syntax and, and text, but they can't really look at context or history or, or anything else. Um, and that led to um, looking at larger stories, like on a speculative realm, um, for a work called Swayatate, which was, I, I was just actually chatting with Danny about working with Studio I on, on that project, um, which is also around the time that um, I think the previous The Fantastic Press Tool was on. And there was a lot of um, conversations happening on the ground. And it also kind of just opened up this space to introduce where 
from your from my own lived positionality of being of a particular caste, like you could actually see what stories were being omitted, and you could start having conversations about that. Um, and which has eventually kind of led now to the work I wanted to show was um, a work about speculative alphabets on in Canada, and then what that means to use um, AI as a tool and not AI as like to prophesize the future or any, anything like that. Um, but really just to say, um, just to kind of like hold the, the tools in, in the space that they are as tools versus, I don't know, the, the promise of, of, a future, of a better future or anything like that. Sorry, it was much easier for me to do this with if I could show my screen, <laughs> um, but that's okay. Thank you. It's the AI overlords conspiring against us. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, next question uh, for Bruce. Um, so Bruce, you've worked across a wide range of uh, media, site-specific work, AI work, um, film, etc. Uh, so since you've used different materials and media across your career, do you think that our fears around AI as a, yet another material are overblown and disproportionate, or do you feel like it's something a little different from what's gone before? Okay, well, <coughs> thanks, thanks for your question. Um, and it's kind of about AI ethics, right? So I, I think as um, a backdrop t to a response, just a kind of reminder uh, that relatively recently, Google ejected a very highly respected AI ethics researcher, Tindak Gabru, simply for asking an uncomfortable question about, um, you know, the kind of the uh, concerns about deploying large language models in society. I think that the, that the paper that was that, the, that was co-authored with Emily Bender, right, stochastic parrots, okay, but she's you know asking important ethical questions, and um, and they kicked her out, okay. So around that time, I I kind of perceived two kind of predominant approaches that artists were using to working with AI tools. So if you go back to 2016 the inaugural AI art exhibition at Great Area, San Francisco. What was it called? Deep Dream, the art of the new network. Uh, if you look at all those contributors, they are predominantly affiliated with Google in one way or another. A lot of them were engineers. Um, so you know, it could be uh, kind of regarded as a, a corporate PR exercise, that, that exhibition, right? And <clears throat> Also, another pre predominant kind of approach that I noticed was a much more critical approach. Whereas, whereas the, 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 the kind of work exemplified by the, 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 the Grey Area show, I kind of imagined that as instrumentalist. It was a much more kind of instrumentalist approach. So using the, the software tools as a means to an end, you know, to kind of produce these images that somehow expressed this kind of reverse engineered um, operation of an algorithm, something like that. So it's kind of more about engineering than it is about art, I think, really. Um, so this other approach I found much more critical, and it was a bunch of artists uh, still, still working, um, but much more kind of uh, uh, engaging with the, the socio-technical, you know, looking at the kind of, the. So, the the social implications of this kind of technology in, in society. People like um, Trevor Paglin and Kate Crawford, for instance, and, and the very kind of influential uh, thing that they wrote. Um, uh, full title of it about excavating AI. Yeah, what's yeah, the full yeah. title? It's um, Excavating AI, the politics of images and machine learning training sets, yeah. So that's kind of examining the implications of using um, not scraped images, that are, they're non-consensual, uh, kind of ending up in, 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 in training data sets to train technical systems. And then 
you know, labelled inappropriately <laughs> by by gig workers. Yeah. Um, so alongside alongside the, that that work, there's also um, Johnson and Verdicchio, um who are making a call for AI systems to be considered uh, assemblages or socio-technical ensembles, which kind of um, show all the kind of social underpinnings of the of the technology, and as, as an expression, um, uh, socio-technical blindness, you know, it's an inability um, from the people, the AI builders themselves, AI researchers, to actually make that connection between the, the impacts, the, the stuff they're making is having, as it, when it when it's deployed. Uh, so that that kind of work, that more kind of critical approach, I, 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 I kind of, um, I saw that it was quite nicely uh, kind of encapsulated by a definition of AI that comes from Maya Indra Ganesh, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So she's an um, AI ethics researcher at Cambridge University. I'll just, I'll just read it out her. As it's a very beautiful definition, especially for artists, I think, if you don't come from a technical or engineering kind of background. Um, <clears throat> Her definition is, AI is a suite of technologies that includes machine learning, computer vision, reasoning, and natural language processing, among others. It exists in an awkward and unique space as technology, metaphor, and socio-technical imaginary. Um, so uh, actually, this kind of sustained work by the likes of uh, Paglin and, and Crawford just actually had a tangible impact in the, in the AI research community, which, I'll, which I'll, I'll kind of say in a minute. Just wanted to mention one other person, and that's um, uh, Joy Bull and Weeme, the, um, who instigated the Algorithmic Justice League. Um, so her, her, she, yeah, so this is a creative project at MIT around facial recognition. Um, so through this kind of uh, creative exploration, she was horrified to discover that there was, you know, these kind of gender and racial biases inherent in the software that she was using. And on the back of that, she formed the Algorithmic Justice League as a way of trying to address that issue. But she ended up standing in front of Congress and educating a bunch of lawmakers, right? Who had no idea that 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 was you know, that the kind of problem was you know was was at the kind of um, the root of these technologies, and also the uh, yeah um, I came across a couple of papers that cite the work of uh, Paglin and Crawford, uh, and a couple of papers coming out of the. Um, the AI research community. Where is it? Okay, here we go. Yeah, so it's, um, Crawford and Paglin sustained kind of exploration of social technical uh, blindness. Uh, there's a paper at uh, Yang et al. from 2021, kind of describing how they are now obfuscating faces in the image net data set. So as a result of uh, Absorbing the kind of the work of the artist, they kind of realise that you know it just didn't occur to them that there were going to be these kind of impacts, so they've, they've started to kind of yeah, obfuscate faces. And another paper, Prabhu and Bahrain uh, from 2020, started to address the stagnant concept vocabulary of WordNet, because you know a lot a lot of the 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 the, cons the kind of labels that were being attached to the images, you know. You know, like a you know a non consensually scraped image of a person, a real person with a label of drunkard, <coughs> going into a data set. Okay, um, so the on the you know on the on the on the back of uh, that artistic kind of exploration, you know, they're they're kind of reassessing um, how you know the use of WordNet in, in, in these kind of processes. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. Thanks. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I'm just going to um, kind of open it up and maybe address a personal bugbear, <laughs> which was that um, I noticed that at uh, COP26 there was um, this massive, there were a number of massive AI art storytelling vehicles to tell the story of how climate change is happening. Uh, and I think that's the contradiction that I've been kind of trying to square the circle on. And I think the thing is that obviously in a neoliberal regime, responsabilization, which is putting undue responsibility onto individuals for things like climate change is unreasonable because we know that majority of these, um, majority of the kind of phenomena that is contributing to the emergency are created by large corporations and the complicity of governments in that. So I wouldn't say that artists need to take personal responsibility for the kind of extractive uh, activities that their art might be creating. But it does, I think, put people into crisis, right? And you and I were discussing yesterday, you know, kind of how do you decide what to use and, yeah. you know, the ethics of that and how you feel it might contradict your messaging. So, Jake, do you want to kind of start off? Yeah, no, I, I feel that quite strongly. I think I've had to do a lot of thinking around this is, you know, especially for NFTs, that, that was the one that really got me. I mean, machine learning, of course, GPU usage, but actually seeing, I think Memo Acton actually is a friend and we've shown together has like released this paper on actually the environmental impacts of NFTs. And I think people weren't really aware of it. And it, it did, it caused a real wave in my community. And we were all questioning, like, where do we draw the line? <laughs> do we want to mint these things? And it's a strange one because, you know, a lot of my friends who are actually really interesting artists that could have made wonderful artworks decided not to. And I mean, I, I don't really believe in NFTs as art anyway. I kind of believe that they're, you know, digital works that are wrapped up in a new way which could empower artists. But I drew the line myself at proof of work NFTs. And I did a couple of community projects that I thought were really trying to think through the issues um, coming with NFTs. But yeah, no, it is a complicated one. And the artists, I don't think they should be held fully responsible, but at the same time, they have the platform to speak out against this and say, hey, guys, we need to put on the brakes here. But at the same time, most of the NFTs were being created of utter crap. Um, so. <laughs> Politely put. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Danny, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how, especially as a curator, Kind of what does the kind of environment of the art market and the way the institutions support certain kinds of art and there's also undeniably a lot of financial interest in funding AI art. How do you think that shapes the future of um, this relationship? Mm, thank you. I mean, such a complex. Um, I'd like to first of all say that I'm only speaking from my very situated position. You know, I'm a British Iranian living in Edinburgh. I'm working a lot in the UK. I'm reaching out internationally. I'm working and I feel like uh, artists I work with that make NFTs or use AI art, I think there's a really uneven distribution of the burdens we bear when it comes to the climate emergency. And that actually individualism that we're sort of um, referencing uh, takes away people's agency and reduces us all down to consumers. And I really urge all artists not just to think about the carbon impacts of your work, but also who are you making it for mm -hmm. and why? Like, how is your work in the service of uh, an industry? Are you really creating a new imaginary or are you just kind of buying into a different type of consumerism and hype? Um, and I feel very strongly about that. Uh, I feel that there needs to be a radical rehaul of why we make art, for whom, and how we support creatives, and how we cre support creatives and artists across borders to be sustainable for the whole of their careers, right? I think there needs to be a lot more conversation around that. Um, I think, you know, I'm not going to talk about the art market because clear. I think it's very clear my position on it. Um, but I do want to say that uh, I do feel that there are some really interesting, maybe not interesting is the word, I feel that there are some really necessary and urgent explorations across uh, art and AI and Web3 technologies at the moment, particularly uh, ones that use data or large data sets to think about ecocide. 
to think about collaborations across different industries and how might huge data sets that are obscure to many people help us build powerful stories to enshrine into law how we uh, defend the enclosures of our public spaces, but also our biodiverse spaces that need saving. People like forensic architecture, but also Angela W. Uh, YT Chan in the UK is doing a lot about that, but also doing a lot about thinking um, about uh, how the military is engaged or how the warfare uh, how warfare is engaged in sustainable arguments and i feel many people aren't aware of these kind of entanglements um, and i think that's where ai art can be really useful i also think um as much as i really agree with you jake that i'm also a little, little bit about this about nfts but i do feel that there's a lot happening around smart contracts um uh, that are really interesting in terms of uh, trying to safeguard uh, spaces for creative production and living communally uh, and in communion with other ecosystems. Um, and how my smart contracts or IP clauses or moral clauses embedded in works uh, that are kind of around technology, how we might kind of scaffold um, legal and economic pressures. So to give you an example, like how might my, my work as an artist um, have a moral clause embedded in it that stops every time any piece of paper or is, is, is kind of printed, let's say I'm writing a novel, how is the, uh, what is the life cycle and afterlife of that piece of paper, right? What kinds of powers do we have using the technology and understanding that we, we have already to embed into the works we're doing? Um, and I feel that's really important. How is your work uh, working towards larger social justice issues? Because we have no time. You know, people are dying now, and it's really important for us to do something. Thanks so much for that, Danny. Um, yes, and moving on to Vishal, um, I think something that I find really, again, confusing about uh, climate storytelling is that it seems to be raising awareness, quote unquote, um, amongst those who are disenfranchised or low literacy, yet those are the people who are at the sharp end of climate change. And so can you possibly say something about how it might be possible to reverse where those stories are coming from and to whom, and how maybe through your work you've been trying to do that? Um, I don't directly work on, I guess, like topics of like the environment and climate change in, in its silo. Um, I think it's it's very much a, a process of being connected to looking at broader themes around like caste and indigeneity and, and language and, and particularly what social hierarchical position you're in and how that um, dictates both the built environment that you inhabit as well as you know the, the larger environmental concerns that affect you. Um, but I think like there's a couple of things. Like the one of the things that I am conflicted about is just how much access there is to be had uh, through these tools, through AI and 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 things like this. And I've uh, even just like looking at Jake's work as an example, as somebody whose work I've followed for a long time. Um, the the challenging aspect of of technically having to have a certain degree of understanding of whether it's programming or coding or or any of that is kind of nearly not there anymore to do things. Um, using AI, like generating images and, and stories and narratives and all of those things. So there is one aspect of it which, which circumvents the accessibility barriers that are kind of put in place by the sort of governance structures that we live under, um, which, you know, just examining, I don't want to do like a very long uh, take on this, but just to examine what it takes for anybody who's who doesn't have generational privilege or wealth or or access to resources um, to be sitting here at whether it's at the SE or in the house that I'm in, um, it's a multi generational shift if you don't come from communities that hold that kind of power uh, historically and and in present. So there is a kind of um, I guess a kind of struggle where. You, like I personally feel conflicted about advocating for folks from my own community. I'm Dalit, like anybody within like the um, Dalit Belgian Adivasi community, like if they are using NFTs to make money, they should. You are like 
jumping through so many generations of of like of inequity that there is no morality there for anybody to critique that particularly in the context of sub of, of of south asia and and the diaspora there is literally zero morality there um considering that everybody is complicit in things like the caste system so like there is no way of critiquing that without taking a privileged position um even to just begin critiquing it but at the same time it's also asking questions like the redistribution of power and wealth particularly where we're sitting in ndic and and you know how these institutions even exist um i think those conversations are equally important to be had like those conversations about um you know like what are the kind of like conversations being had about the redistribution of power and resources particularly when it comes to um access to like even art education or tools uh required in the arts like just like an example i keep giving is that like a lot of times in conversations about technology and art which i seem to have a lot is that we're talking about very different timelines um there's the timeline where the contemporary art world the global scholarship around ai and tech exists there's the timeline about capital and economy and and all of that which is the pinnacle of what is the building that the ic is um where technology and and those two timelines meet and then there's the subaltern timeline that a lot of people from my community come from um and the timeline that we are existing in so and in that timeline like the the kind of questions are more about survival about representation they are still the same questions being asked um questions which are not relevant for contemporary art discourse they're not relevant for future facing technologically you know bleeding edge kind of discourse or like the demonstration of like look at this fantastic supercomputer that can build you know 9 million data sets that's not the conversation the conversation is having 24 hour access to internet 24 hour access to to um to power and and running water and these things and these are things that people are like oh like you know we're trying to like take poverty an example it's not <laughs> people are living in in a big bubble particularly when it comes to conversations around ai and tech and the, and the environment um i think that is the the point in which the questions i ask particularly to organizations even organizations like teach fantastic is asking like how many bulgarian creators do you have in your cohort how many dalit artists do you have how many adivasi stories are being told uh by themselves please not a green piece approach where somebody else is telling the stories of 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 the people whose land they live on but where are the, those stories it, are you trying to tell me that they're not making the stories or are you telling tell me that there's a gap in how much technology they've been able to access and i think that is for me a lot more critical and crucial aesthetically sure we can all i guess like use the tools and make really cool things but um if the knowledge in how to make that and using the tools that we do if the that knowledge and, and the tools is not being redistributed and not being allocated in ways that are beneficial to communities at large um which i absolutely believe is the responsibility of both an artist and organizations that we work with um because otherwise like why are we having these conversations <laughs> we're just like oh cool like we're just going to talk about some of this stuff but if we go back and and a gate keep both knowledge as well as like access to resources then i feel like conversations are just that they're just coffee table conversations fantastic thanks so much for that yes well deserved applause thank you um and i think the i think absolutely I, of course you know completely agree with you but i also kind of wonder whether we as in kind of speaking from a position of privilege there needs to be much more deeper conversations about reparative action right and how that kind of contributes to this kind of very necessary redistribution and i think we don't talk about that enough and so it'd be really good to see more of that kind of conversation happening in this space uh bruce if i may go to you um so do you think it's inevitable given that ai is so you know so dependent on these extractive data sets and you know all of this maximalist um work and processing power do you think it always will be that like do you think there's a possible you know stylistic move away that still uses ai but uses it on kind of more minimal ways more interesting ways do you, do you have any thoughts around how that might be 
Yes, thanks. Um, oh, no. Try it again. Yeah, they might just need to turn it on upstairs. Is that, <laughs> I, I just turn it on. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, no, it didn't work. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do think that there is a watershed moment right now, okay? I mean, in, in terms of how search is being reinvented with these large language models. Um, apparently, search as it is, you know, as we've come to know it, accounts for about 1% of the global carbon emission. Of course, about the big companies don't um, disclose that kind of information. You know, they, they, they just don't do it. So whenever you, whenever you come across this kind of analysis, it's coming from third, third party. So, if, it's, so if, if the old way of doing search, i.e. kind of indexing all the web pages and you know, and entering a search query and looking up and delivering it and all, all that, uh, is 1%. If large language models become more and more integrated into search, that's going to increase five-fold. Um, all of the infrastructure will have to be updated to deal with all the computation. You know, it's incredibly expensive computationally using, using language models. Um, and it's clearly an unsustainable trajectory. So for, for it to become sustain, sustainable for the companies, they have to make the computation cheaper, i.e. they have to reduce inference times. They have to switch to green technologies, I think, to power all of this. So, so, so it's, we're at this kind of point where um, it might get, it, it actually environmentally, the cost might, through innovation, might be, it might improve, or we're all going to hell. You know, it's, kind of, it's kind of like that. Uh, but I, I, I also, you know, the situation in Ukraine, you know, so Ukraine being regarded as a crucible for innovation, is, so it's a green light for all, all of the, you know, these kind of hawkish kind of technology sort of like developers taking us a step closer to killer robots and all of that kind of scenario. So that's that, that's kind of happening as well. Um, so I, 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 for me, it's very very uncertain. You know, I, I've no idea, and I, but. I, I can imagine, you know, all sorts of things can happen, I guess. But from, from my, my previous point, I think it's really important that artists are in this space. You know, when the companies are sacking the people who are asking the difficult questions, it, it's really crucial that, that there are independent artists in the space, kind of maintaining the conversation, I think. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up now because I think we're running a little short on time. But uh, Jake and Bruce are around if you need to ask questions. If you would like to um, message uh, Danny or Vishal, their information is on the website. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna have to wrap up. But thank you so much for this uh, really productive conversation. Uh, thank you so much for being a very receptive audience. Um, and yes, hopefully this has given everyone some food for thought and we can continue the conversation elsewhere. Thank you.